Okay, then maybe we can start. Uh, <clears throat> so once again, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Victor Ouillard. Uh, I am a researcher and a teacher at Université Saint-Louis Bruxelles uh, and at the ULB, uh, the French-speaking University of Brussels as well. Um, I am part of uh, the Edmo network and of course uh, Edmo Belux uh, and I'm really happy to welcome you all for this first lunch session. Um, so if it's okay with everyone, I will give you a, tell you a few words about Edmo Belux uh, and then about uh, why we are organizing this. Uh, I will then introduce uh, our colleague uh, Grégoire who has uh, kindly accepted to be the first uh, presenter of uh, this series, and then we'll get started. So what is EDMO and, and what's EDMO Belux? Uh, EDMO stands for a European Digital Media Observatory. And basically what we're trying to do is to bring together fact checkers, uh, media literacy experts, and academic researchers to uh, understand better and al analyze this information. Uh, and then we collaborate with uh, media organization, uh, online platforms, um, and, and other experts. EDMO has hubs all over Europe. Uh, and uh, the hub that's organizing uh, today's uh, lunch lecture is Edmo Belux. So it's the hub for Belgium and uh, Luxembourg. Um, <clears throat> uh, and today, uh, we are about to start again, uh, the lunch lectures. The, the idea of doing that actually came out of um, a conference that we did uh, a few months ago uh, in late 2022, uh, we did what what we call the research day, basically bringing together researcher working on, on this information and related topics uh, in and, and, and around Belgium. Um, and, and what came out of that day was, well, there's actually a lot of people working on that <laughs> and we should get together more often. So, the idea was to organize research seminars and then together with Tom Willart and, and Trisha Mayer. Tom uh, uh, is uh, my twin, my research twin. Sadly, he's not here today because he's sick, but he will be there for the next lunch uh, uh, lectures. To, together, we elaborated this. Uh, and the goal is to have these lunch lecture once a month. Uh, yeah, the idea is that we can invite people who work on, on topics that are of interest um, in a more, let's say, informal setting, or at least a, a setting that allows a researcher to present what they are working on more than uh, final results uh, of, of their research. Uh, and so the idea is to have a, a talk that's around 30 minutes, uh, followed by Q&A. So, since it's the first lunch lecture, where uh, and since we actually have a lot of people, uh, more than forty of you guys have registered, uh, we're really happy uh, about that. So the the idea is that we'll have a written Q and A today, so you can write down uh, your question in the chat. I will try and collect them. Let's see if there is a lot of not, and and ask them to to Grégoire. Uh, and then we see if it doesn't work, we'll try something else next month. It's a it's a work in progress, really. Uh, so yeah, I will now give the floor to Grégoire. Um, I, I must say I'm really happy that Grégoire is is going to be the first one uh, presenting at this lunch session. Grégoire Litz, he is a uh, teacher and a researcher at the UCL, the Université Catholique de Louvain. Uh, he's uh, a member of uh, Edmo Bilux, uh, of our hub, and so we're really happy to have him. And uh, today he'll be talking or, or giving us a talk about that he called Measuring and Defining Informational Vulnerability, a proposal at the intersection of psychology, political science, and media studies. So it's uh, focusing on this information, but uh, uh, with different approaches. Uh, Grégoire, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm here. Uh, I will stop you if there is anything wrong. So if you have to focus on your presentation, uh, you you can. Uh, and yes, thank you again for doing this. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Victor. Uh, 
Uh, I will try to, to, to share my slides before I start. Yes, should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Um, so I'm Grégoire Litz. I'm assistant professor at UC Louvain, uh, where I chair the uh, Observatory for Research on Media and Journalism. Uh, that's a research center about the evolution of journalism in society. And uh, we put a lot of effort to understand all the- Grégoire. Yes. If, if I may, there is one thing that I have to say and that I forgot. Okay. Uh, we cannot see you guys, but you have to know if you write questions down in the Q&A that this session is recorded. We have to tell you this, uh, but of course we can see you. Okay, sorry, uh, Grégoire, go ahead. Okay, uh, and so as I said, uh, in our research observatory, uh, we mainly work about the circulation of information and uh, especially on the digitalization of the public spaces that we can observe today. So um, studying disinformation, conspiracy theories, and so is quite at the core of our interest. And uh, so I'm really happy to be part of this seminar and to bring you a bit of information about what we do. Um, maybe one small uh, disclaimer. I will not present uh, bold research results. Uh, we'll try to uh, present what we are currently doing uh, the model we are building. So uh, I will bring you in the kitchen and not in the, the room. Um, so um, to discuss some uh, of the, the, the stuff we are developing today. So it's a, a work in progress more than a final result of a, a research program. So what I will do, uh, maybe come back in the history. Uh, my talk will mainly be about the COVID-19 infodemic. Uh, why? Because it was not only um, a medical crisis and emergency, but it was also an informational crisis, as you know. Uh, the WHO call it an infodemic even. Uh, they said that if you want to fight COVID-19, we had to fight the infodemic. So uh, for us, it's quite interesting because uh, it was a huge informational crisis. And I think it's uh, a good case study for us. And it's important to uh, see what we can learn, learn from this informational crisis. And it is what we try to do, uh, because we think that some of the tools we have developed, developed to study this infodemic could be used to study, for example, climate change of the wars in Ukraine or some other crises that are coming. So uh, we try to uh, keep up about the, the research we can do about that. So in 2020, in March, we directly started with a research program to try to um, assess the reality of this infodemic phenomenon and to try to develop a model to be able to measure it through time. And uh, this, it is this model that I will present today uh, to see how we can track this information and how we can measure the vulnerability to misinformation. That, was, that is the final goal. So just to give some information about our survey, what we did is a cross-sectional quantitative survey in Belgium, in French-speaking Belgium. Uh, we currently have five waves of this survey that uh, went out. The last one was in June 2022. And we tried to um, ask the same question to a panel to see how they get information about COVID-19, uh, what they believe about the COVID-19, uh, do they believe in misinformation and so. Uh, and to try to assess the perception of the reality of those persons. So we have a sample of about 3,000 uh, people uh, in the first wave, and then a bit less after that. So, yeah. so as I said, before, at the start of the crisis, the, there was two ways of measuring uh, the circulation of misinformation. Basically, most of the research, um, they try to measure which kind of information has more virality. And the way of doing that was to extract big corpus of data, mainly from the social network, to see if some pieces of misinformation has more virality than uh, normal information, for example. Um, another way of studying this information was to try to track the effect of uh, misinformation on people. Um, and we had some research going on like this. Um, we tried to develop something else, uh, a bit more um, um, interdisciplinary, and uh, we tried to measure also the effect of this infodemic, the COVID-19 infodemic, but using a uh, theoretical prism of five, uh, five um, stuff. So the first 
influence we have is media sociology. Media sociology is to study the construction of public opinion and personal influence. We also use some uh, tools of the field of public understanding of science. So it's a branch of uh, sociology that study the way of how lay people, normal people, relate to science and scientific facts. Um, and there is a very interesting stream of research there to understand how people get information and uh, relate to scientific information. We also use some tools coming from the field of uh, social amplification of risk. That's a field of study that's uh, surveyed uh, the way all risks are diffused in society and all risks are percepted by the lay people. We use some tools from psychology, uh, mainly a way to measure anxiety and depression and what is called by psychologists conspiracy mentality. And also we use some uh, tools coming from the information disorder paradigm, uh, more recent field of research about information disorder, misinformation, fake news, etc. So what we try to do is to define uh, infodemiology, this new discipline that I'm studying infodemic, uh, and we put it at the crossroad of US media sociology, risk communication and amplification theory, and what is called the informational disorder paradigm. So you can see in the bubble here the kind of stuff we use and the tools. Uh, for example, the more political uh, stuff are here in the informational disorder padding uh, with polarization and echo chambers, for example. Um, we have the medical metaphor that is implied in infodemiology coming from US media sociology, in fact. Um, already in the 30s, the scholars studying propaganda, they use this medical metaphor to study the effect of propaganda on people. And here we have the maybe the most interesting piece, I think, is all the research that study the relationship between lay people and experts and scientists, which I think it's very important to understand this information. And in this field of research, we, you also find the key variable that we use. Uh, the key variable, I think it's has to be included in a model to understand infodemic is trust, uh, because we know that um, trust in the um, station of diffusion of information is key to understand how people relate to information. So what we did is try to build a quantitative model with indicator to measure all those dimensions of uh, infodemic, of vulnerability to misinformation. So the first indicator we build, built was um, try to assess the informational practices of the people and the level of trust. We also try to assess the perception of risk linked to a phenomenon. Of course, during the COVID-19, what risk linked to COVID-19, but we could imagine to measure the perception of risk linked to climate change of a wars. We also have a module of question to analyze, analyze the beliefs in false information and conspiracy theories, of course. We also have a set of questions to assess the behaviors of the people. During the COVID-19, it was health behavior and the adhesion to governmental measure, but we could imagine um, to measure behavior linked to climate change. And we also have sets of questions to uh, assess the psychological impact of information, like anxiety, depression, of the link with conspiracy mentality, as I said. So, it led us also to set uh, three hypotheses that we want to measure with this kind of studies. The first one is that um, as a manifestation of an infodemic, of an informational crisis, like during, during the COVID-19, what we observe is uh, mostly a modification in the relationship to information and in the general level of trust in legacy informational sources. Second hypothesis, so, we are here at a general level, uh, more collective level than individual level. Second hypothesis, uh, as a manifestation of this crisis, we will observe an evolution in the general level of anxiety in society. And third hypothesis, uh, we want to uh, assess the, the place and the role of social network and social media. And we can set the hypothesis that, for example, actively seeking information on Facebook on other social uh, network about a phenomenon amplifies the observable effect uh, of the infodemic, the effect on the informational practices and on the uh, psychological uh, variables. 
So I come back to some results of the survey. Um, here, that's the characteristic of poor sample. I will not uh, get in too much detail about that, but what you see in green is that the fact that we try to over-represent people using Facebook as an information source is in our sample. So it's not a representative uh, sample we use, but a sample to compare, compare uh, people using Facebook with the general population. And then some uh, conclusion. I don't know how many time I have left, but I think I should be on track. Oh, you have time, you have time. Yeah, okay. So um, I will not go through all the, the results, but um, what I, I want to, to point out is the fact that with this model, we came to uh, develop a way to measure what we call, we are not the only one, but to call infodemic vulnerability. And if you look to the literature about this topic, I think there is a growing interest about what is called informational vulnerability or other study work about the people that are less resilient to misinformation. Uh, you also find studies about the people that are more susceptible to misinformation. So the, it's a moving vocabulary, vocabulary to, to talk about this phenomenon. But we could see that some people, um, they were more at risk of being misinformed than others. And so uh, being infodemically vulnerable, it's like being more than others at risk of getting a cancer or developing a severe form of COVID. And we could develop um, research design um, inspired by uh, medical research to try to assess and identify the factor of risk of being uh, infodemically vulnerable. So it's a metaphor and through this metaphor, this research methodology aims at finding different risk factors of being misinformed. I think it's important uh, because we have to go beyond what I call the usual suspects about misinformation. If you look into a newspaper or in the public and general discourse, uh, we, we hear a lot that, uh, for example, the youngsters are more at risk because they take more views of social media, or that only low educated people or non native English speakers are really problematic regarding misinformation. But, but we know as researchers that it is not true and it is. Uh, too much shortcomings to, to say stuff like this. So we have to make um, important research about the real risk factor behind uh, this uh, susceptibility to misinformation. So what we, we, we discovered or we, we can show with our study, it, uh, is that a first factor of risk is what we call uh, attitudinal news avoidance. Uh, we have seen during the COVID-19 crisis especially uh, since May 2020, a uh, rising share of the population that tell us uh, I stopped to take information from the traditional and the legacy media. And that's quite uh, important. In OCD, you see here the, the results. We have a strong rise uh, since uh, two years from the people that uh, answer the question, how often do you use the following sources of information, like radio, uh, newspaper, TV journals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in June 2022, we have 38% of our sample that said, I don't use any of those sources regularly. So it's quite uh, worrying, I think. And you see uh, the level in May 2020 was much lower. Um, we can look at this news avoidance phenomenon uh, and compare the people using Facebook as an informational, informational sources relating to COVID-19 and other people. And you see here also a clear difference between those, those two kinds of users. Um, in orange on the graph, you have the uh, people that don't use Facebook as an informational sources. And here in blue, you have the, uh, all the other uh, people that answered the questionnaire. So what you see here is a strong difference especially at the end of the COVID-19 crisis in March 2021, so one year after the start of the crisis, of uh, the way the people get information. We have 45% of the people using Facebook as informational sources that don't use the legacy media, which is quite huge, and only 23% of the other people. 
Um, the good news is that today, yes, today, six months ago in June 2022, the gap was closing down. So it seems to be maybe a um, local phenomenon during the crisis, but still uh, it's an important difference. And what we don't know, of course, is if the people who stopped to get information from traditional media get into Facebook as a result or a consequence of this phenomenon. It's a correlation. We, we don't know which one was first, of course. A second result, inter interesting result, I think, is the level, the evolution of the level of distrust. So as I said, what we try to do is to conceptualize infodemic and informational vulnerability as a long lasting modification of the relationship to media. And in assessing the evolution of the level of distrust in media and informational, so informational sources, we can track this phenomenon. Here you can see we ask the people if they have trust about uh, news about COVID-19 that they receive from the TV journal, for example. And here you see uh, huge differences between May 2020 and June 2022. Um, and the differences also between members of Facebook, Facebook groups about COVID-19 and other people. And you see here uh, an important rise of the level of distrust among the general population, but a huge rise among the people using Facebook as informational sources. And in June 2022, in our sample, we have 70% of the people using Facebook group as an informational source who said, I do not trust the TV journal. So it's quite a quite strong effect, a quite strong number. Um, we tested other informational sources. Um, you can see that the experts in epidemiology of virology, um, they were very, very uh, a lot trusted at the beginning of the crisis. And you see that it's more or less stable to the crisis for the general population, but the people getting information on Facebook group, uh, you see a strong rise of the level of distrust about uh, experts, which is quite worrying too. And that's kind of the same story for every category, every sources we tested. Uh, for example, the federal government, you, you see the evolution. Um, also the uh, health professional, the health professional, like the nurses, the pharmacian, the medical doctor, they are the, still the most trusted sources about COVID-19. Um, and you have here um, a different category of sources in article shared by relatives on social media. And for these sources, you could see a difference. It's very stable uh, for the people using Facebook. No evolution, which is quite interesting too. But uh, you have a strong rising of distrust among the people that don't use Facebook during the crisis, like 16%. Okay, that's the same story with the graph, which show uh, the evolution of distrust. And I think it's important to, to notice that even for the people that don't use social media as an informational sources, the level of distrust um, about the most uh, viewed um, informational source, which is TV journal, uh, is very rising uh, since two years. So we can look also at the third uh, variable, I think it's um, anxiety. And in our study, uh, we used um, very uh, general uh, measure of anxiety, which is called the GAD7 scale. Uh, that is a scale used by psychologists for uh, measuring anxiety disorder, uh, very common tools. And we have a lot of studies, even before the infodemic crisis, using these uh, tools. And we know that in Belgium, the general level of anxiety of people maybe having a general anxiety disorder is about 11% in the population. That's the red line on the graph. So during the crisis, the general level of anxiety uh, was rising a lot. And what you see here on the graph uh, is the red curve uh, of the general population. So you see a small rising of the level of anxiety coming back to 13% in 2022. 
But we also see that the level of anxiety of the people using Facebook as a primary sources of information is much more higher. So it seems to have a, a link, a correlation between anxiety and the fact to use social network as main source of information about uh, uh, crisis events. But the good news um, compared to um, uh, the, the usage of informational sources is that today the level of anxiety seems to be back to normal which is not the case with trust. It's a clear difference between trust, I think, we has been very impacted by the crisis, trust in media, and anxiety that is back to normal after two years, almost. So that's the fourth variable we try to test. It's the um, belief in conspiracy theories. Uh, for COVID-19, it was quite easy to find conspiracy theories, as, as you know. So in this graph, uh, we tested the COVID 5G theory. I'm sure you know it. It's the conspiracy theory that said that uh, the COVID-19 vaccine gave you a 5G chip that uh, will enable Bill Gates to control you, your brain or something like this. Um, we tested this theory in the questionnaire. And you see, again, a strong difference between uh, the not member of COVID-19 Facebook group and the COVID-19 Facebook group user. Um, and you see the, the same panel of uh, uh, decreasing of this belief in the population during the crisis. Um, we have a small rising between March 2022, 21 and June 2022. We, we don't know why, but maybe we could see that it is an epiphenomenon. It's not very common among um, the population. So last thing we, we did with this survey, we tried to get uh, more simple uh, tools to assess uh, infodemic vulnerability uh, by crossing two variables. And those two, the two variables we use to build a simple, clearer model is informational practices, which kind of media you use to get information, and trust in legacy media. And we assess people's relationship to information by crossing those two variables. And by doing that, we obtain three risk profiles and one profile of low vulnerability to uh, misinformation. So that's the final model we use at the moment. Um, so you have two, two variables, the people that do not trust legacy media, like TV, radio, and newspaper here, I don't know if you see my, my mouse. Yes. And um, yes. the people who trust do have a high level of trust in legacy media that, that are here. And on the other axis, other axis, you have the people who have no frequent use of legacy media, the news avoider. And you have the pe people that have a frequent uh, consultation of at least one traditional media. So it's a very inclusive model because uh, it's enough to follow one traditional legacy media like radio or or TV to be here. So even if you are here, maybe it's because you, you watch a TV journal three times a week, it's enough to be here. Okay. So that get us uh, four, four uh, theoretical profile. The first one is the high informational vulnerability, uh, regrouping people with no trust in legacy media and no frequent use of legacy media. At the opposite, we have the low vulnerability profile people who get a lot of information in traditional media and have trust in traditional media. And then we have two intermediary risk profile, the news avoider, so the people that have trust in legacy media but don't take information from them. And we have those that we have called the infodemic bulimiac. People do have no trust in traditional legacy media, but they consume a lot, a lot, a lot of information. And we see in the, the, the statistic very clear pattern that some people, um, they, 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 they consume, in fact, too much information. They have an overload of information with this profile. And it's even more problematic. You can see, we, we will see that the high information vulnerability profile. So just to get, give you uh, some idea, I will not go into detail with the the, 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 the data and the results, but we crossed these four profiles with two variables. Uh, no, first, an idea of the share of the population. Um, in March 2021, one year after the crisis, we had a low vulnerability profile 
that's about 50% uh, of our sample. The high vulnerability is about 22%. The uh, bulimiac is about 16%. And the, um, the, the fourth type is 9%. And what we see with the time, uh, because the level of trust is declining uh, through time, we have those three profiles that are rising. The, the, the two, the profile here and here, the red and, um, and uh, orange that are rising because of the rising of the level of distrust in SC media. So last uh, information, if we cross that with some variables, so we have all four profiles here and we tested, for example, the um, vaccine hesitancy uh, about COVID-19. It was, of course, uh, before the, the, the vaccine, like in 2021. And what we see is that the much higher you are on this axis, the, the more you are willing to get the vaccine. And you see that the low vulnerability profile, we have a very high level of acceptance of the vaccine here. And the low vulnerability profile, at the opposite, we have more than 50% that don't want the vaccine. Um, that's quite a strong effect of, uh, on this variable. So other um, variable we tested here is the belief in conspiracy theories. Um, we we, reported, we we grouped in an indicator five conspiracy theories about COVID-19. And then if you have a five here, it means that you believe the five uh, conspiracy theories. It's quite rare. And if you have zero, it means that you believe zero, uh, no conspiracy theories about COVID-19. And again, what we can see here is a very strong effect of our model. Uh, we can predict a bit the fact that if you have a strong vulnerability to misinformation, meaning that you have a low trust level of legacy media and you don't get information from legacy media, you are much more at risk to believe in misinformation and conspiracy theories. Yeah. Okay. So that was just a glimpse um, to explain what we tried to do. Uh, that's a model we are still developing um, today. We are trying to decline it to study climate change uh, at the moment. So um, it's still in the making. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to presenting it. I hope it was not too, uh, too broad and too general, but uh, thank you very much, Victor, for the invitation. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll be the only one uploading, but I'm uploading in, on, on behalf of, of everybody. Um, uh, questions are, are coming in um, from the chat as well as uh, uh, on WhatsApp. Can you see the Q&A or not? That's my first question. Uh, um, because I will try to group the questions, but maybe sometimes it's easier. Uh, yes, I think I get the question, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, but maybe we can start. Uh, so first of all, thank you. I think it's it's really interesting piece of research, uh, especially um, <clears throat> uh, in well doing this questionnaire to the people who are actually uh, in touch with with this information. Uh, and I like the fact that, as you said, you're trying to go beyond the usual suspects and 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 what we hear a lot. Huh? You know, young people are at risk. Uh, this kind of people are at risk. <laughs> Um, and I think that's really interesting. I do see two questions on the methodology, and I think that could be a good start. Yeah. Um, the first one is, uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, the, the purpose of those uh, COVID-19 Facebook groups? Was it about general or sharing general information or uh, more towards conspiracy related things. So mm -hmm. what are the Facebook groups that you're talking about? I think it is really, really so uh, it, it important. Also, we, we, we try to recruit a lot of different profile in our sample. Uh, the questionnaire was diffused in the traditional media. We diffuse it on Facebook with sn snowballing uh, procedure. We posted also a advertisement on Facebook and we posted it on uh, COVID-19 groups. And among the COVID-19 groups, it's very diverse. Uh, you have, of course, conspiracy groups, uh, very clearly uh, with conspiracy theory and so, but you, we, we had also a, yeah, a, a group of a municipality of the citizen willing to get information about COVID-19. So it's quite diverse, I would say. Okay. Um, and you didn't measure the difference in belief when distrust between those two kind of subsamples? No, no, it was 
quite difficult to, mm. to know. Yeah. Of course, but I think that that's like a, a, the, the intuition behind the, the question from... But it's quite difficult to do also because uh, even on very yeah, less normal group uh, with no conspiracy theories, you could have suddenly a post uh, very conspirationist with a lot of engagement. So it's quite difficult to make a clear distinction between a conspiracy group and a other more citizen group. It's, I think it's difficult to do. Yeah, yeah, and some people can be part of that group because they believe in that conspiracy or for trolling or for multiple yeah. reasons. So it's hard to tell why. I guess for us, it's it's, it's quite difficult, in fact, to measure uh, the, the fact that someone gets information from a social network about a social problem. Because uh, if you ask the people what they do, it's very difficult that they give you an honest answer because most of us, we don't know how, how we get information. So um, it was basically the, the best proxy we imagined to assess the fact that someone gets information about COVID-19 on Facebook to uh, isolate them um, that obviously are part of a group about COVID-19. So this, yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> there was also another question that was sent regarding methodology. Um, regarding the survey waves, mm -hmm. first wave is 3,000, fifth wave, I don't remember, I think it was half. So the person asked, uh, uh, was that a, a problem in your, in, your, in your survey or did some people get tired of it or is it just because... Uh, the, the, four, the four first wave, we try to be in line with the evolution of the epidemic. So we launched the survey uh, at the peak of the epidemic on at the lowest level. And the fifth way, it was just a follow-up uh, two years after. Um, we asked the people to give us their email address so we could have a kind of longitudinal data. And the fifth, fifth way, uh, wave in June, uh, we just relaunched the questionnaire for the people uh, that with the email address. So it explained why we have much less people. And so it's much more difficult to compare also with this wave. Yeah. yeah. But I, I must say also that this is... Uh, clearly an exploratory survey uh, whose aim was not to be representative but to test the theoretical model and we have other survey going out go, going uh, on with um, pool um, agency pooling agencies uh, with much more robust uh, design but we use the, the same model and the results are quite in line with uh, the first exploratory, exploratory survey here and uh, the more robust uh, design Mm. Yeah, because I was going to say, you don't have to be so modest. Huh? 1,300 after fifth wave of, of a study, especially if you're doing it yourself, is already quite impressive. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite uh, <laughs> we have a few more questions. Uh, there's one that, that's, I think, in line with the, the Facebook group question from Ingrid. Uh, nice, nice to see you, Ingrid, um, or to read you, I guess. Uh, the question is, how did you take into account the change in content and amount of news about COVID-19? Uh, and then she, she says, especially in more recent times, <clears throat> the general idea has been that the pandemic is over. How does that change the perspective of the audience? Yeah, I think it's quite difficult to answer this question. <laughs> uh, and it, one of the, the answers I can give is that it will be very difficult to do the same survey today uh, because uh, it's like if COVID-19 does not exist anymore. Uh, and so even in June, when I, I was drafting the questionnaire, I had to remove a lot of questions because they do not make sense anymore. So it's one of the difficulties of this research design. I think it's that we have to um, connect it to a social problem that is currently discussed in the, the media. So. Uh, that's one of the limitations, and that means also that we will not be able, I think, to do uh, a sixth wave of the survey because uh, COVID-19 seems not to be a problem on the public agenda in the agenda processes of the media uh, at the moment. So it's quite of a difficulty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's say, finger crossed, you will not be able to do it again. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. But I, I think it still stands. I mean, the, um, the idea that you're trying to replicate this with climate change and with other questions is really interesting. Uh, and and the question remains: huh? the when when the the way a, an issue is framed changes over time. The question is that how the audience takes it is is. And we have uh, the same um, uh, problem with measuring trust. Uh, there is a lot of uh, research that are being conducted today about trust in media. But what we see is that if we ask uh, if the people trust media in the context of COVID of in 
related to other social problems, the level of trust we will observe will not be the same. Um, so we, we designed a different set of questions to differentiate different kind of trust. I didn't went into detail into the presentation here, but I think it is one of the stake of this kind of research is to have tools that we can use to assess general level of trust, for example, but also level of trust linked to different social problems and to connect and to try to identify what beyond, beyond those problems is identifiable as a um, factor of trust or not. Yeah. Mm, and I think that the link with the way lay people um, get access to scientific information uh, is very crucial to understand this phenomenon. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, I do want to link a couple of questions together because they seem to, to keep coming come in. Um, Uh, someone said, and I think I can link a couple of questions together. Someone said, uh, as you mentioned, people often uh, generalize the profile of high-risk people, like young, lower social class, and so on, as, as we said, usual suspects. Uh, in that regard, were you able to find commonalities in the sociodemographic data of the participant you qualify as high risk do you mm -hmm. have some some data some 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 characteristic yes. uh, and someone in the chat also asked about for example the religious or the faith factor in the model or you know yeah the religious you mean yeah religious for example uh yeah we of course we were able to find some commonalities in the um, social demographic data um we found that in general people with a lower level of education was, were more at risk that young people and very old people were more at risk than middle-aged people, stuff like this. But what we also observe is that um, if we are interested in which are the people in the very vulnerable profile, we find people from all the socio-demographic group. So very often, I think it's a, a shortcoming really to, to associate this information with young people uh, or with slow educated people. For example, one very, very strange um, stuff that we observed in the last round of the survey, uh, if we differentiate, differentiated the level of education uh, at a more granulated level, uh, we have seen that the people with the PhDs, they are much more, that they have a much higher level of distrust toward legacy media than the people with a master, which is huh. quite surprising. So, uh, so there are more seems to be more at risk of misinformation than people that with a lower level of education, which is quite counterintuitive. Contri 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 uh, so we still have to dig in to understand that phenomenon. So P PhD students are are told to be more too critical, maybe. Yeah, too critical sometimes. <laughs> maybe, uh, Okay, we, we, we have uh, some, some more questions coming in. Again, I'm, I'm trying to kind of establish a, uh, a, a thread. Um, someone said, thanks for the, the presentation. Could you explain how you define the criteria to assess the levels of vulnerability? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you can tell us about that, how, how you made the criteria to see the high risk and low risk. Yeah. Um... At the moment, we still we, we use only two variables, uh, which is the the kind of uh, information source you use uh, on a daily basis. Like uh, if you look to the TV journals or read newspaper, and that's a proxy to assess the link to information. And uh, on the other side, we have the level of trust. And I don't know if you want to get into detail, but um, I'm not sure, I, I totally remember, but I think for the, the information sources variable, we use the fact that if you use one legacy sources like TV or radio or newspaper uh, three times a week, at least you are considered to be uh, following the news in the legacy media. And for distrust, we just take the people that fully distrust on a scale on one to seven, I think, uh, we use the two first uh, level to say you distrust if you say I fully distrust or I distrust. And then we put, so we were very, um, very uh, comprehensive in the, the way we, we put people in the vulnerability group. Okay, thanks. 
Um, but who aim is to complexify this model and to also put the psychological data in it, uh, variables in it, which still uh, are not in it. And uh, we think that there is, for example, a link between anxiety level and the fact that for some people reading the news is quite uh, like give a lot of anxiety. And we, we are trying to think on how to put that in the, the model of informational vulnerability. But we still don't know how to do that. <laughs> that would be too easy. Uh, one question about uh, distrust versus trust. Um, so, so we saw the, the this rising level of distrust. Uh, uh, I think TV journal for the Facebook group users was up to seventy percent. Uh, but we also uh, see a rise in distrust of experts, uh, federal government, health professionals. Uh, and relatively stable uh, for, for friends and social media. Uh, do we trust anyone anymore? Did you ask question about who do we actually, who do they actually trust? Yeah. Uh, it, it, did you try and measure that? Yeah, we try to diversify. One, one first thing to say is that here we talk about trust about COVID-19. And mm. if we look at general level of trust in media in general, uh, for example, the Oxford Internet, uh, the Oxford uh, Reuters Institute, they do the survey every year. Yeah. You see that the level of trust seems to be quite um, stable. Yeah, I think it's the, around 50% for, for, for Belgium. Yeah. 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 But that's because they just said the general level of trust. So um, here we are just think, talking about COVID 19. That's quite uh, important to note. And uh, we try also to uh, investigate the, the fact that uh, we differentiated trust in media in general, in the media institution. Uh, that's the question I presented. But we have other questions about trust in journalists. And uh, we use a set of questions coming from psychology that define trust with three, um, three key uh, sub variables like honesty and stuff like this. Um, and we are still try to interpret all those two level of trust, trust in journalists as individual and trust as, uh, in the media institution is correlated, with, is linked. So it's it's a, a nice field of survey to, 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 to look at. Yeah, and there is a lot, a, a lot going on about this research question. Uh, a lot of literature is coming in the, the newspaper, uh, the journals today about that. Yeah. And that, that, re that relates to, to David's question, I think. If you can see it, I think it's the last one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I have to ask it because David was and is still my mentor. So, no, he, he's actually asking about media literacy. Uh, and did you try and measure that in some way uh, in, in the questionnaire, in the survey? Because it feels to him and to me as well, I must say, that a uh, profile of low vulnerability, vulnerability can be just linked to people who, 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 who assume that professional journalists are always right. Uh, don't really have much critical thinking. So did, did, you, did you measure that at all? No, <laughs> no, that's a very good point. Uh, that's a thing also we try to, we, we will to put into the, the, the next round of question, uh, if we do the survey again, um, to complexify a bit uh, what is low vulnerability and all, and why people are in this profile. Uh, that's a good, uh, good point here. Okay. But I think one of the, Maybe something more interesting that the low vulnerability profile is what we call infodemic bulimiac, because very often we have this idea that uh, consuming news will protect you from disinformation. What we observe it is that for a small percentage of the population, but still it's 15, 20 percent of the population, uh, they consume a lot of good quality information, but they still believe a lot in misinformation. So we have the extremely critical uh, people that get a lot of information and spend a lot of time to get information and compare the different version of an event on Facebook and the social media, in the press, in the general press, uh, that are also problematic. So um, the, the picture is not uh, uh, as simple as low information, low vulnerability versus high vulnerability. I think all those intermediary profiles are much more interesting to dig in. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And that relates to my research where we do mm -hmm. we do more qualitative research, but we try and differentiate people who only consume uh, mainstream media news, people who only consume alternative media, those who can't consume both of them. Um, and again, are they critical about it or not? Uh, I think we answered most of the question. If you have one final question that you want to ask, uh, please uh, do. Uh, there is one question from Marta um, uh, regarding, uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to read the paper related to this. Since, you know, this is a more informal setup, um, I think it's a question that can be asked. Can we find that research anywhere? Are there people that are going to be coming out? Uh, would you recommend anything related to 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 what you've presented today? Uh, yeah, sure. The, the pilot studies uh, I presented, we have an um, ORM report uh, called the COVICOM, COVICOM 1 and 2 report that you can find on the website on the slide here in the, the, the part publication. But we have also uh, two or three papers um, about another study we've made with the pooling firm in uh, eight countries at the same time with the same variables that have been published. Um, yeah, I think it's also on the website. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Grégoire. Uh, is there any final question? Uh... There was one, I'm not sure I understand correctly, but how will the in artificial intelligence such as AI, chat, GPT, be integrated in the model of the future? Do you have <laughs> any thought related to artificial intelligence or how chat GPT will influence that? Actually, I, I don't do that, but we have a colleague, uh, Stefan Ball, who is working at University of Exeter, and one of my colleagues, Antonin Descamps, that, that you know, yeah. uh, have a, a project to, to test the, the, the fabricated artificially uh, generated uh, fake news uh, videos and they use it to test to see if it has an impact on the people with a, a de uh, experimental design so yeah there is a uh, interesting stuff to do there also but I, I don't do that but we are quite aware that it will uh, um, have an impact of this information of course yeah okay well thank you very much Grégoire uh, and and thank you again for for uh, starting this lunch lecture. I think this was quite um, successful, but again, this was only a, a first try. So if you have any comments or feedback, uh, <clears throat> please uh, feel free to say so either in the chat or uh, to shoot us uh, to shoot us an email. And again, if there are some questions that we haven't answered, please feel free to send them towards us and, and either I'll try to answer them or forward them to Grégoire or to, um, to anyone else. Um, we, we will be following you, Grégoire, and hopefully we can invite you in one year or two and you can tell us about the next waves of the, the study and, 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 and what you're working on again um, at that time. Um, for the others, please come back. Every month we will try and have a, a lunch lecture. will be related to this information, but also polarization, hate speech. Uh, yeah, just a diffusion of, of news online. Uh, if you are here today, you will probably be invited. Uh, but if you're not sure, you can always subscribe to the Edmo um, uh, newsletter. Uh, oh, well, there is a QR code here, so you can even take that in pictures. So again, we will try to improve uh, and to have those lectures every month. But I will, I would also like to invite you um, to another Edmo seminar, which will be held not online, but IRL in real life uh, at St. Louis uh, on the 15th of March next week. Um, if you don't see the chat, hopefully you see the chat. If you can't see the chat, you, you can find it uh, on the Edmo website and on the uh, Engage, so Saint Louis website. We will have uh, Alban Tartari coming from the University of Tirana, who will be talking about fake news in the Western Balkan, uh, tackling disinformation at the sideline of the European Union. So actually talking about disinformation, production, uh, how it is produced in, in, Western, in the Western Balkans um, and how it's made. So once again, thank you, Grégoire.
Uh, thank you everyone for, for participating in this first uh, lunch lecture. Hope to see you next time. Uh, have a great afternoon. Have a great week. Uh, and uh, talk to you all very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Grégoire. Bye. Bye.